I would like to welcome you to Centerville High School. My name is Cambra Edmondson. I'm the PTO president here at the high school. And I'm um, very happy to see you coming out and supporting this wonderful event with Dr. Henderson. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to mention two quick things. We had a couple um, little things of paper on the tables outside the door. And I'd love for you to grab one of each. Uh, the big one is just some information on how you can support the Centerville High School PTO whenever you shop at Amazon Smile or at Kroger. It's very easy. And then this tiny little one um, has our dates of PTO events for this year. And we have two events still coming up. Uh, March 3rd is our College and Career Fair, which is just an absolutely amazing event here at the high school. So if you have um, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, come on out because it's a great night. And then April 9th is our college application prep night for parents of juniors. So if any of you have juniors, um, that'll be a really interesting night for you. So um, with that, I would just like to uh, welcome Dr. Henderson. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you, Canberra. And again, thank you to the uh, high school PTO for sponsoring this event tonight. Uh, this is the fourth time uh, that we've had an opportunity to do this. Uh, we look forward to sharing with you tonight um, the things, the, our accomplishments, the things that we're proud of, and, and talk to you about maybe some of the challenges and the things that we're looking toward in the future. So I appreciate you being here tonight. I know there is um, some competition tonight uh, to be here or other places. Uh, out in the, our main gym in the back, uh, to, the, to the back of where you guys are sitting is uh, the JV and freshman bas boys basketball is playing altar tonight, so that's always a, a big draw and kind of a big rivalry for us. And I know that UD is playing home tonight, and they've had an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented uh, season this year, so um, I appreciate you guys being here. I, I don't know if that's uh, keeping some people away or not, but uh, anyway, uh, I do appreciate you, you being here tonight. Uh, you know, over the winter break, I, I worked and I had an opportunity to catch up on some things in my office, some uh, paperwork and also things that I put to the side, reading and things like that, that I uh, try to do when it's a little bit quiet in the district. And, and I was reading it, one of the educational journals that I had put to the side. Uh, it was a, a leadership journal and I was reading about leadership and I was reading about uh, the power of collaboration. Um, and reading about how successful schools are when they create a culture of collaboration. And there was a quote in there, it was actually, actually an, an African proverb, proverb that said, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so tonight, I really want to say to all of you, and I want to show and, and provide examples, I think, of how Central City Schools tries to go far, tries to really go the distance by going together and by working with everybody in our school community, both our internal stakeholders and our external stakeholders as well. So uh, with that, um, I do want to acknowledge um, the great team that we have in this school district. And I'm gonna start with our Board of Education. Um, our Board President for this year is Mr. John Dahl. Vice President, Mr. Jeff Schroyer, uh, he's on his way. He just sent me a text and he was running a little bit late from work. We do have board members, Allison Dernbaugh, who's sitting up here kind of in the central section, and Megan Sparks, also one of our board members up there as well, and Dr. David Rohr, uh, who could not be here tonight. We appreciate uh, their leadership, and they are a great team that uh, help lead this district and provide um, great leadership for all of us. And they are the type, those five elected officials are the ones that really keep an eye on what's most important in any school district, and that's the focus on the students, so we definitely appreciate that. I also have most of the administrative team here tonight. Most of them are sitting to my left. Some of them are out in the audience as well. Um, they have lots of evening commitments, like a lot of us do, and I appreciate them taking some of their time uh, to be here tonight to support me. I know that's why they're here, and I appreciate that. I know some of them had UD tickets as well, so this was a big sacrifice. So thank you guys for that. I was told for several of you as you came in that you gave up your tickets, so I appreciate that. So thank you. For a number of years, we have had um, students at Centerville High School that have been um, 
chosen, gone through an interview process, and um, are working as student board representatives. So currently we have six uh, Center Hill High School students, Grace Leedy, Jacob Myers, Madison Ernest, Katie Wagner, Muhammad Mustafa, and Ben Thomas, uh, who work um, in conjunction with uh, some of our board members. Uh, they attend our board meetings, and uh, they do share, uh, kind of from a student perspective, um, about things that they're thinking about, but they also seek out and gather input from their peers here at Centerville High School. And this year, kind of a new initiative for them was to reach um, down into our three middle schools and solicit input from those students as well. So we appreciate uh, their efforts and everything that they do as well. As you all know, this past November, we had a very, very important issue on the ballot. It was issue number eight. And it was just about a year ago um, when we started the year of 2019 where we knew that we were gonna be on the ballot in November and we started soliciting input uh, from both our inside and internal um, stakeholders and our external stakeholders seeking and soliciting information about the things that our community both inside and outside felt was important. And so we started with doing some in-depth in phone interviews. Uh, we did some focus groups. And then right after spring break, uh, we did a 400 um, sample phone survey. Um, we brought all that information together. Uh, we shared it with the Board of Education. And that really drove us to make some decisions about what we thought and how we thought we should approach um, November, the election in November of 2019. Quite honestly, one of the things that we heard was some information about our facilities. Um, and that became a part of our message as we went into our levy campaign. Uh, we learned fr from the surveys and from the focus groups that um, it was very, very, very important to our community to make sure that our, our buildings were kept up very appropriately. And we worked really hard to do that. We have a great staff that worked hard to do that, uh, to provide maintenance and custodial efforts and things like that on an ongoing basis. And I think sometimes, uh, for somebody like myself, who's been in the district for 29 years, we see these buildings, we're inside the buildings, and we know the hard work that goes into maintaining those buildings. But we did hear that our community felt it was very, very important to make sure that there was money uh, and the resources to make sure that those buildings were kept up appropriately. And so that was one of the decisions, or why we made the decision to put part of the ask. We had a 6.9 mil levy in November, as you know, and one mil of that was for permanent improvement. And permanent improvement monies are basically for building and infrastructure repairs, renovation, and other long-term uh, facility needs that also include things like school security and technology. And maintaining and repairing our buildings and keeping those um, like I said, in good order uh, was very important to our community. Uh, most of our buildings are about 50 years old and we have Magsic Middle School is, is 95 years old and, and even PBS, our newest building, is about 10 years old. So uh, it doesn't take long for those buildings um, to get some age to them and, and obviously to maintain those is extremely important and the passage of Issue 8 was very important to allow us to do that. The 5.9 uh, mil part of the operating piece of the, the levy uh, was designed to help us with operations. And so the message that we used there was uh, that we felt it was important to always make sure that we could go out and recruit and retain highly qualified teachers. Um, updating safety and security for our students and staff was part of that message again. Uh, continuing the college readiness and the advanced placement programs that we have here at Centerville High School. Uh, continuing to provide up-to-date technology, uh, expanding programs that would help in the area of being, uh, helping our students be career and college ready, and also different workway pathway programs, and also maintaining reasonable class sizes. Our enrollment is growing, uh, it is not exploding, but it is definitely increasing. And so uh, we'll need to address that, uh, we believe, in the future as well. So we would like to, and I would like to thank the, the community for their support. Uh, we knew that asking 6.9 mils was a big ask, but it was important to us and uh, it will help us as we move forward. So what I'd like to do tonight, in addition to sharing some of our accomplishments, I want to tie those things that I share with you back 
to some of the messages that we had during our levy campaign for issue eight as well. Uh, I hope to talk no more than about 40 minutes. I'll try to keep my comments brief and, and keep on track with that. And at the end, we are going to open it up for any questions that you may have. And so uh, two of my colleagues here, to my right, to your left, is Dan Tarby, our director of HR. He's got a mic and a wireless mic. He'll turn that on. To my left over here, to your right, is John Westney our director of business operations. So uh, they're fast and they will run up and down the stairs and, and, uh, and get those mics to you so everybody can hear your questions and, and we'll respond to those. So we have seven departments in central office and, and I'd like to kind of uh, talk about those seven departments in my comments tonight. And we're gonna start with the area of curriculum instruction and assessment. Uh, Bob Yux, our assistant superintendent over here to my left, is uh, the, the one that's in charge of curriculum instruction and assessment. He has two great um, uh, people that work with him, our director of secondary curriculum coordinator, or excuse me, secondary curriculum coordinator, Adam Trello, and then Cherie Colopy is our elementary curriculum coordinator. Uh, they work very hard and have responsibility for all of the different curriculum aspects that occur in our district. Not only that, but implementation of various new courses of study, assessment, ongoing revisions of those courses of study, and working hard to provide continuous improvement strategies for all classroom instruction. So they work very, very hard in all areas of curriculum and also take on ownership of all the, the testing that we must have and that we must um, facilitate to all of our students. You may have read in the paper, and something that we're very proud of, that just recently uh, five of our Centerville schools were designated as Purple Star Schools. Um, just last week we had a gentleman come down from Columbus and make those presentations to uh, Centerville High School Principal John Carroll, Stacy Westendorf Principal Magsic Middle School, Tyra Heights Middle School Principal Clint Freeze, Brian Miller at Watts Middle School, and Mindy Klein at Primary Village North. Um, we felt really good about this, and we have other buildings that are going to be looking at, at getting this designation as well, uh, probably in the spring or even next school year as well. But the Purple Star Award really recognizes that schools show a commitment to students and to families who are connected to our nation's military. We know in many cases those children come to us, have gone to many, many different schools across the country, and we work hard to make sure that their transitions are as smooth as possible. And we do a lot of other things in support of our military families as well. Next, under the curriculum department, just to share some of the services and the programs that they're responsible for. As I mentioned before, the instruction and the assessment, uh, they also are in charge of literacy support, gifted services, English language learners, staff development, guidance services, and they help administer and, and um, are in charge of all the federal grants that we have in the district as well. As far as report card goes, a uh, report card comes out you know, once a year, uh, something that gets a lot of notoriety. Um, we're proud of the fact that this is the second year in a row that the district has received the Momentum Award from the Ohio Department of Education. Uh, to receive this Momentum Award, the district must receive A's, on the value added measures, um, and this is always one year in arrears, so this is from 2019, in four categories. Those are overall category, all students and all scores, uh, gifted students, students in the lowest 20% achievement, and also students in the category having disabilities. There are only 22 districts in Ohio that have received this award for two years or more and they, the state uses a value-added formula, which they don't release, so it's kind of hard to explain what that is or how we're, we're doing so well on it, but we're working hard in all areas of, of our assessment and with all categories of students uh, to make sure that uh, we're doing the very best for all of our students. I would share with you that the higher that our students achieve, the harder it gets to continue to show a lot of growth. And one of our elementary buildings kind of fell into that this year, and you may have read about that, and that is Weller Elementary, which is one of our high-performing school, elementary schools in our district. Um, they've performed very, very well over the years, and this year they failed to show growth uh, on this measure in fourth and fifth grade. 
Um, and so this means that, that they become a school district, a school labeled an, an Ed Choice school. And Ed Choice has gained a lot of notoriety. Um, there's going to be a press conference out of Montgomery County this coming Friday. All of the 16 county superintendents are going to be signing a letter uh, sending to our state legislators because we believe that Ed Choice is one of the most aggressive voucher programs in the country. And the number of schools in Ohio that were identified for vouchers has grown from less than 300 schools last year to over 1,200 schools just this school year. So um, the thing that happens with that that is, is so hurtful to a school district is that we get about 1,000, a little bit over $1,700 from the state, from the Ohio Department of Education as a revenue source. And when students uh, take advantage of that voucher, in this case, this case students at Well Elementary, uh, they will take $46.50, $4,650 with them. So we only get about $1,700, a little more than that, approximately $1,700 from the state, but we lose a little bit under $4,700. So, um, and this is not just with Centerville. Um, all high-performing schools are now being affected by this. Uh, you may have also read that um, the Sullen, which is up near Cleveland, is uh, rated as probably the top, one of the top three school districts in the state. Uh, very high-performing school and uh, school district, and they also are an Ed Choice district, and they have Ed Choice schools as well. So. Um, one of the frustrations we have is, is that, but um, those kinds of things when you talk about funding and revenue sources. So getting back to the things that we're very proud of, though, again, continuing in the area of curriculum is here at Centerville High School, we have an amazing career education program that we're very proud of. Strong partnership with Sinclair. <laughs> we actually have 12 offerings here at Centerville High School, and I've got those listed here. We're also in a compact with Kettering Schools and Oakwood Schools, and so there are six other programs that our students have an opportunity to participate in, and you can see those are listed there as also under the off campus programs as well. So uh, in many cases, students that go through these, this two-year program here at the high school will ro roll right into receiving a, a full scholarship to attend Sinclair University, uh, free of charge for two years, get their associate's degree, excuse me, and then uh, have an opportunity. There's reciprocity agreements with UD and other uh, four-year institutions here in the area that they can roll into, uh, usually at a, at a discounted tuition price. So it's a great deal for our students and an amazing opportunity for them uh, to come out with a, a great skill set at a reasonable price point and not too much debt. So again, as I mentioned, we have great partnerships. One of those, again, is with Sinclair Community College. Um, I do want to mention one of the amazing things that uh, Bob, our, our Director of Curriculum <coughs> Instruction, and John Carroll, High School Principal here, Adam Cirello, and some others that were res um, really responsible for bringing an advanced manufacturing class to Central High School. We know that there are some students that, that maybe are not going to go to a four-year a college and get a four-year degree, but they're more interested in maybe getting an interest industry credential or a two-year associate's degree where they can still come out and make a, a very, very good living wage. Um, this advanced manufacturing was an opportunity for Sinclair to come in at no charge to the district and actually teach, co-teach with some of our high school teachers here. This is actually Mr. Mullenkamp who teaches in the uh, industrial arts area here at Central High School working with the student on the picture there and um, provide an opportunity for these students to actually come out of Central High School with an industry credential in the area of manufacturing and they can make some decisions at that point to roll into a job right away and make a great wage or uh, decide to go on to other things like at Sinclair for example. We also have a, a great opportunity with, with Sinclair um, Eric Earhart over here is our principal at the School of Possibilities, and he's worked very, very hard to get students involved in internship programs. Uh, we have students that have taken welding and been part of other manufacturing uh, jobs and, and um, uh, careers that they've entered and have done very well as, as well. So College Credit Plus is something that you've heard about across the state of Ohio. We have students involved with that. Obviously, here at Central High School, we have a very, very strong college prep 
program that includes a lot of advanced placement courses as well. We've also been working very hard, um, actually uh, for over a year now, uh, to increase uh, our awareness uh, surrounding diversity and inclusion. Um, we had a, a very powerful professional development day in, in the fall. Um, again, uh, with Bob's leadership and his curriculum team, um, we were able to bring in Dr. Larry, Larry Burnley, who is the Vice President for Diversity from the University of Dayton, and Tiffany Taylor-Smith, who works with him in that role at UD. Um, basically, they spent the day with us. Uh, we had all staff involved in the program of um, study at the Performing Arts with presentation, along with some dialogue and some breakout sessions, and then we came back together uh, to share uh, ideas and comments and things like that. Uh, but basically, uh, we're working hard um, to uh, increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in our district. Um, again, credit to our curriculum department. Um, uh, Bob wrote a human capital grant, which uh, we were able to receive $29,000 in the area of diversity. And this is designed to recruit, retain staff from underrepresented racial and ethnic populations to better serve all students. So, We've entered into a, an agreement with Wright State and Central State, and I know there was actually a meeting this afternoon to uh, continue those conversations as we move forward. And I'll talk more about that when we get to the HR part and talk a little bit about what else is going on and what Ann Tarpey, our director of HR, is working on as well. Uh, we also have a, um, um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Um, right now there's kind of a steering committee there that includes uh, four teachers. Um, in our um, district and they are working to champion kind of the cause uh, to promote cultural knowledge and self-awareness of our staff and our student body. Um, they're working hard to enhance trusting relationships and to build an inclusive environment that celebrates the uniqueness of all families in our district and they're encouraging the recruitment and the retention of diverse persons so that our staff is reflective of our vibrant community that we live in. So we are working very hard to continue those initiatives. It's something that we, we have made a strong commitment toward and will continue to do that. We have also have a strong and have had a strong partnership with UD in a lot of different areas. Um, one of those um, over the last several years has been with uh, a program known as IACT, and that stands for the Institute for Applied Creativity for Transformation. Uh, we actually um, uh, worked with that group, um, and they came out and worked with our group, and we had a lot of professional development as well. And uh, basically, there were uh, three uh, statements or three challenges that came out of that work that continues on today. And it has to do with uh, student learning and the different things that surround our efforts to make sure that our students are independent thinkers and critical thinkers as well as being creative thinkers. And those are, how might we empower students to find purpose in solving complex problems? How might we create encouraging and engaging collaborative learning communities? And how might we redefine student success through failure and perseverance? So uh, that initiative that started with UV and with IAC continues on as well. We also have a, um, been fortunate to receive another grant um, to the tune of $25,000, and it's through Equal Opportunity Schools. And the goal of Equal Opportunity Schools is to increase the number of minority and under-resourced candidates taking AP, or Advanced Placement Courses. We know that there are a lot of students, diverse students out there, that, that think that they can't take Advanced Place Courses or shouldn't take Advanced Place Courses. And with this grant, we're working um, with Equal Opportunity Schools, doing a lot here at Central High School. That started with surveys of all the students here. We're promoting the opportunity for all students to have that opportunity to take advanced, course, advanced placement courses. And we're even adding advanced placement courses as part of this initiative. And again, uh, this is part of the, the promise that we made to continue to do great things for our kids during the Issue 8 campaign. Other things that we have as far as curriculum initiatives are um, math materials and textbooks we're piloting. Uh, we hope to have that completed uh, with, by this spring. We hope to adopt those and 
go to our board and ask permission to purchase those um, for the 2020, 2020 to 21 school year. Uh, there's also a lot of work being done in the area of English language arts with curriculum mapping and, and EL and visioning. And we'll always continue to work on literacy and writing instruction K through five, focusing on the standards, uh, using data, and making sure that we're, our lesson plans are, are following the standards. So curriculum's been very, very busy and working hard uh, for a lot of great initiatives that are going on there. The second uh, category that I'd like to move on to is our student services area. And Tammy Deere over here to my left is the director of student services. Uh, basically the student services is a, also a fairly large department and it encompasses a lot of variety of programs and services for students across the district. Uh, one of those um, areas that, they, that Tammy works with and her staff work with is in is special education students. About 12% of our student population falls in the category of special education. It's about 995 students. To help support those students, we have three special education coordinators, seven school psychologists. Uh, we actually have 93 uh, teachers that have the title of intervention specialist and 115 paraprofessionals. Also occupational therapists, physical therapists, and 10 speech and language therapists as well. So. Um, a lot of people supporting uh, a lot of great kids um, working through some of their, their learning challenges. Uh, we also have an area uh, that is close to uh, special education and that is uh, students that are on 504 plans. We have a little over 300 students that have 504 plans. We also have a preschool program at Primary Village North and Primary Village South. Uh, it's actually a 50-50 model and that means that we have about 50 students in each class that have special needs and 50 students that are typical. Uh, that's the recommended model, the best practice model from the Ohio Department of Education, and those programs have, have done very well and have done great things for the students in, in those programs. Uh, this again, and I'll pause here for just a second and share that once again, the Ohio Department of Education is looking at making some changes to preschool programming. And one of the things they're looking at doing is currently the preschool teachers that we have are dual certified. So they're certified as intervention specialists and, inter and also certified as early childhood regular education <coughs> teachers as well. Um, the Ohio Department of Education has been looking at this for a couple of years and they're thinking that maybe a better way to go would be to actually add an intervention specialist as one teacher and also an early childhood teacher as one teacher. So that basically means doubling our preschool staff, which obviously is, is a big ticket item. So something we're watching, something we're a little concerned about, obviously is something that's an example of maybe an unfunded mandate that might come down the pipe that, that we'll have to deal with and fund and, and obviously hits our budget per card. Um, obviously, school health is part of our student services department as well. We have six school nurses and eight clinic uh, nurses that support our students in, in that area. Um, Tammy also oversees all the home instruction, school attendance, truancy. And we have a partnership with South Community. Uh, we've had for many, many years uh, an opportunity to work with South Communities with students that have been identified with behavior challenges in our buildings and certain buildings in our district, we have units of students that have those challenges. Uh, but for now, for three years now, our Board of Education has been very supportive and, and appreciate their support. Uh, we've expanded our um, use of South Community and um, that has served our, our students very well. We have a lot of students that are dealing with a lot of issues, stress, uh, depression, and uh, this has been a great service to partner with our school counselors in all of our buildings and uh, they feel that it's been a great resource to help our kids out. So uh, that's been great as well, but again, that's a resource that, that uh, does hit our budget as well. The next area I'd like to talk about is business operations and I mentioned John Wesley will be having the mic here in just a minute to open that up as well. But John is in charge of all the purchasing in the district, uh, he oversees uh, maintenance, custodial, transportation, food service departments. I can see up in the audience, we have our great uh, 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 supervisor of transportation, assistant supervisor up there. They do a great job. 
with uh, about the 120 buses that roll every single day. Um, but John also administers all the permanent improvement monies, uh, as well as all the facility planning, building renovations, and also new ins new construction. So, again, that permanent that one mil of permanent improvement monies that was passed in November will help John be able and his staff be able to keep our facilities uh, looking great and making sure that their upkeep is is uh, the way that it should be. There's Andy and, and Andrew up there. They're known as the A team at transportation here. But um, um, anyway, um, we are a member of the Southwest Ohio Educational Purchasing Council. There are about 180 school districts from 18 counties here in Ohio that are part of the, the EPC for, that we call for short. This gives us a lot of buying power. So um, this helps us save money, helps us be fiscally responsible um, for our community. Uh, we're able to get good prices on volumes of goods and services, classroom office supplies, uh, food, vehicles, utilities, and also insurance. So this has been a great thing for our district as well. John has an assistant business manager. He's here today as well, Mark Dom, over here to my left. Uh, Mark um, spends a lot of time and specifically oversees the maintenance staff. Uh, there are nine full-time employees along with some part-time summer help that we have. So we have 14 facilities in the district and we have a little under 1,300,000 square feet of building space to take care of and it's a little bit under 300 acres of grounds to take care of. So uh, Mark and his team work hard to make sure the facilities are in good operating order, um, making sure that equipment is replaced and um, um, delivering preventive maintenance to all of our buildings. So they stay very, very, very busy and uh, do a great job. Some of the projects that John and, and Mark and, and his staff, along with some uh, people that we've contracted with, uh, that we are using some of this new um, uh, permanent improvement money for, uh, we finished a lighting project at Stingley Elementary. Uh, we have replaced those fixtures with LED fixtures, uh, which has created an opportunity for us to um, save money uh, regarding energy. It's also helped improve um, safety and security uh, provided better, na better natural light in all of our classrooms. Um, we're gonna continue that project and Magsic Middle School is the next building that we'll be working on. Again, an opportunity to use uh, the support that we had in November of, of 2019 with that permanent improvement money. Uh, we've also worked hard to make sure that all the HVAC equipment is, is up to speed and um, we're now in the process of replacing uh, 20 to 25 year old HVAC classroom units. Um, looking at doing about seven of those at Driscoll. We have some large rooftop units at Tower Heights and Watts that we'll be doing in the near future. Probably Tower Heights this summer and Watts behind that maybe next summer. And then 18 classroom units uh, were also replaced at Stingley, Normandy and John Hole last summer. A year ago, when I gave this address, um, a year ago, um, we had a question about our bathrooms. And again, I'm in the bathrooms, just the men's, but um, you know, uh, one of the questions was, have you been in, in the restrooms? And I said, I had. And they said, well, you know, your fixtures are old and, and they look old and, and they're in need of renovation and replacement. Um, and we took that information, we took that question, and we, we did take a, a hard look at, at everything that we have. And so, Really, since that, that meeting last year, uh, we have worked hard to do some upgrades and to improve with new fixtures. And so, you know, we have replaced new tile, sinks, water closets, paint at John Hole and Driscoll. We have replaced eight community sink fixtures um, and some uh, new locker um, shower fixtures at Central High School. And 12 sinks and fixtures have been replaced at Weller as well. In the area of school safety, um, John has also been working on increasing the surveillance cameras. Um, he's actually uh, doubled the amount of cameras here at Central High School, security cameras. Uh, the middle schools are starting here in the very near, fu near future, and then that'll be followed by the elementary buildings. So um, he's made a, a great um, a mission to update and increase the number of cameras that we have in our building. We also, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, we have about 120 school buses on the road every single day. 
Um, it's important for a district to replace those on a regular annual basis. If you wait too long, then it's almost impossible to replace too many buses at one time. So our goal has always been to replace about seven to nine buses every year and rotate those out. Uh, we then, uh, once we get those new buses in, we may keep one or two uh, for spares, but then we sell the old buses and actually even make some money off of that as well. I'm also proud to announce to you that we also re were able to receive an EPA grant uh, for over $200,000 that will also help offset the purchase price of 10 new clean diesel powered buses that we're going to buy this year. So again, another great opportunity to save money for the community. Um, we just recently, the first week back from the winter break, uh, we had Ohio Hem Homeland Security in uh, to do an assessment. They were willing to do an assessment of three buildings in our district, and that's kind of the limit that they'll do in any school district. Uh, we had them come into Centerville High School here, at Watts Middle School, and at uh, Primary Village South. So uh, it'll be another three weeks or so until we get those reports back. But we wanted, we feel like we're doing a lot in the area of school safety, but we really wanted some experts to come in, uh, do an assessment, um, you know, an unbiased assessment, and then uh, we'll use those reports to continue our efforts to make sure that we have what we need to make sure that our schools are safe for students and staff. Um, but we're working very hard to, like I said, to increase cameras to make sure that uh, access is being controlled, and intrusion detection, all the other things um, that you would expect from school safety. In addition, um, John and his staff also work hard to make sure that other parts of our facility are kept up to par. That includes, you know, um, exterior doors, uh, asphalt and seal coating. Uh, high school track is, is old and needs to be replaced down the road. Probably we'll be looking at doing that maybe this summer. Also, just general painting, carpet, and tile replacement. Here at Central High School, most of the carpet here um, was here for almost 40 years. Uh, my wife was a graduate of Central Schools and Central High School, and the carpet was here when she went to school here uh, many years ago. So uh, there was a three-year uh, effort by um, vendors who came in to replace the carpeting. This is an example of the new carpeting here in this uh, Central Theater. Um, the other things that, that we do that people may not realize is that our nine maintenance staff also are responsible for taking care of all the, the lots that we have during inclement weather. So uh, they are the heroes that get up. Um, they are the ones that plow and salt um, and, and take care of all that. And then our custodians, of course, clear all of our entrances and exits and, during those inclement weather when it snows. This winter has been kind to us so far, which we're happy about. John and I have been able to get some sleep this winter so far. Uh, we're hoping that that continues all the way through February and even beyond. We are also, and again, one of our messages, like I said, was making sure that our facilities were, were in good shape. And so uh, we are working and have just finished a, uh, uh, a quote process looking at uh, a firm that's willing to come in and assess all of our facilities to kind of help us develop a master plan uh, and it prioritize, you know, maybe what should be done first and second. We feel like we have a good handle on that. You know, for example, all of our roofs are under warranty. We've worked hard to keep things up to date with our lots and our HVAC and our lighting and all those things that I mentioned. Uh, but we'd like uh, uh, an outside firm to come in and, and do an assessment for us as well. Uh, in the area of human resources, Dan over here has one of the mics, and uh, you know we're a large uh, organization, and uh, Dan and his uh, small department uh, provide human capital services to over 1,000 of our employees. So we have about 575 certificated staff and 450 classified workers. Um, Dan believes in customer service, and so we work really, really hard to support all of our staff. Um, both current and prospective staff every day for every individual. Um, so Dan works hard to make sure that his department attracts the highest quality of candidates to support our needs, uh, our students' needs. Uh, we pride ourselves in hiring the best of the best. For anyone that has been hired in this district, they will tell you that it's a very, very rigorous process, and in most cases, they go through five or six interviews. 
So we vet them very thoroughly you know, before we offer them the position, and uh, that has served us well over the years. Uh, but Dan's department also has a responsibility for all the personnel files, issuing of contracts, uh, is, uh, administering board policies. Uh, he's in charge of all the substitute personnel and helps staff maintain all of their credentials as far as certification and licensing. This spring, in fact, the end of February, Dan will go to his first career fair, but Dan will be attending eight different college career fairs across the state of Ohio, uh, uh, starting with UD, Central State, and on down through Wright State. There are also two additional uh, job or career fairs that happen in this area. Uh, you can see a Dayton job fair in the middle, and this is a consortium of most of all of the public school districts uh, in Montgomery County. Um, and then we have our own little uh, in-house uh, career fair, we call it Meet the Candidate Night, that we've had for many, many, many years, where we bring the best of the best candidates in here as well. Uh, Dan is working very, very hard to put himself in a position where he does see diversity when he goes out and does interviewing. We will also be using um, the, the committee, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, to go out with Dan to these career fairs, as well as our other administrators to, uh, again, attract and, and hopefully find some diverse candidates out there that we can uh, bring in into our fold. So he's working very hard in those areas. Shannon Morgan right here in front, kind of helping uh, with the technology tonight, um, is our uh, Director of uh, Information Technology. Uh, we all know that uh, technology is so important and it provides services both administratively and instructionally to everybody, to staff and students and administrators throughout the district. Um, as a response to the successful levy campaign last November, uh, we've already begun implementing plans to improve technology in the classroom. So recently we purchased an additional 1,400 Chromebooks. Shannon and his team have been busy uh, unboxing those and getting those ready, and he's already started deploying those out to buildings and classrooms throughout the district. So by the end of this month, which is by the end of next week, he plans to get those out. We were just talking tonight, uh, several high schools going to be invaded by I don't know how many Chromebooks tomorrow, right? And all kinds of carts coming in tomorrow. So um, when you combine these 1,400 Chromebooks with about the 5,500 Chromebooks that we already have, we're just about at one device for every student that we have in the district. So um, we're hoping to continue to match enrollment and to, to keep those, the number of devices uh, adequate for the number of students that we have in here. And we found, have found that the Chromebooks have been really, really a great value. In most cases, they're lasting about six years. They're pretty sturdy. Um, they kind of work uh, well with even younger children in our district, and they're, like I said, they've been a great value for us, and they've been lasting about six years, which is a long time in the area of technology. Uh, future initiatives that Shannon is looking at is uh, improving our internet filtering and security. Um, you will read about the paper, you know, the, the worry that a lot of corporations and school districts have with you know, the different things that people can come in and steal your information or take hostage of your information. And Shannon, that's one of Shannon's fears and it's one of the things that we do training on with our staff. Uh, he'd like to improve the, the variety and the, the number of wireless access points and controllers. And he wants to uh, continue to improve classroom display systems and also administrative workstations as well. Sarah Swan is our community relations person. She's right behind Shannon and is actually taking this program tonight. Um, Shannon's been with us about, about four years, five years, and, and, um, and Shannon's been a great asset to our administrative team. Um, she uh, puts together and produces uh, the Accent on Your Schools quarterly, um, and she also is responsible for launching a new website uh, that was launched about four years ago. So, uh, she does a great job of putting the good news out to our community. Uh, currently, our district uh, website is being um, accessed by about 31,000 users each month, and it's been a great tool for us to, like I said, put a lot of information out to our community. The website also has a mobile app on the, at the Apple Store, and Sharon work, or excuse me, Sarah works hard to continue to 
make sure that our site is ADA compliant. Other initiatives that Sarah continues to work on is all areas of social media. Um, our Facebook likes have grown to about over 7,000 followers with an average monthly reach of about 127,000 and about 3,600 followers on Instagram. Um, just this year, Sarah released our third quality profile, which was sharing highlights from the 2017-18 school year with our community. Um, 2019-20 plans have included sharing information about um, you know, more things that we're doing in connection to our messages that were related to um, our November levy campaign. Our, our treasurer is over here to my left, Laura Sauber, and um, the treasurer in any school district is the chief fiscal officer for the Board of Education, the chief accountant, payroll officer, and auditor, and also the chief investment officer. Additionally, Sarah, um, Laura works with uh, the rest of our admin team to make sure that uh, we work hard to prepare an annual budget to monitor internal controls and she oversees the audit process. So last semester we had a group of auditors in the district like we always do. Uh, they finished right before the winter break and we received another what's called an unmodified audit for uh, fiscal year 19, which is the highest opinion possible by the auditor state. So, we're proud of that and, and we appreciate that. And over the years, we have won other awards, the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting, and we're continuing to look at, at other tools to help us do long-range budgeting uh, as we work towards appropriations for next school year as well. Some of the challenges that treasurers face and school districts face in the area of revenue is that our district is considered a high wealth, low poverty, uh, school district. So our two main resources, state funding and local tax support, have been impacted over the years. Um, our former treasurer was always using a, a figure of 87% of our re revenue comes from local support, which is property taxes. And we only receive a certain amount from those property taxes. So when we pass a school levy, the auditor certifies how much money that is going to collect. And even though um, there may be additional things that happen that cause real estate taxes to go up. We still only continue to receive that same amount year after year after year. And that was part of House Bill 920. So it re actually reduces the tax rate as home values grow. So we only receive that amount that was certified by the auditor when a levy is passed. So there's no inflationary growth or no inflationary gain that school districts get for that. So it's hard to continue to operate for years and years and years on that same amount of money. Um, and again, most of our support, because we're considered a high wealth district, does come from our local community. So again, uh, we work hard to be as responsible as we can with the money and work hard to um, make sure that we're um, doing everything we can to be conservative in our spending. The other thing that is a challenge for us is that over $1.3 million left our district last year because of school choice, uh, where parents and students were making the choice to go to other um, open enrollment community and STEM schools and taking advantage of going there. And again, just like with the Ed Choice, uh, we get a little bit over $1,700 for the state. But when those students leave, like if I use Ed Choice again as an example, they take a little bit under 5,000 with them when they go. So we only get a little bit, but we lose a lot when those students leave our district. And that's just another example of some of the unfunded <coughs> uh, mandates and changes that occur um, from the state that, that it do impact our uh, fiscal uh, resources. So kind of where are we going in the future? Um, from a curricular standpoint, we're gonna always continue to make sure that we use best practices um, we're continuing to look at how we deliver instruction to our youngest learners in preschool and in kindergarten. Uh, currently, we're looking at our delivery model for upper elementary um, grades, fourth and fifth grade. Uh, there's some research out there about departmentalizing or compartmentalizing, where uh, fourth and fifth grade classrooms do uh, allow their students to travel and move uh, between classrooms. Uh, so we're looking at that. Um, we're also looking at our middle school model and, and the, the value of, of a model that we've had there that has served us well for many, many years. 
And for the last three years, we've been doing a study of the high school master schedule and uh, looking to make sure that that's meeting the needs of all students as well. So we'll continue studying those things and continue to work on um, trying to make the best uh, decision that we can and what's best for kids. So what does the future hold and some of the things that, that I believe will be challenges for us in the future is the first thing is we always promise that we are going to be fiscal responsible. Uh, we report monthly, at least twice a month, to our Board of Education. They're always in the know about our financial situation. Um, and we will continue to be as fiscally responsible as we can. Uh, one of the campaign messages, again, was to maintain all of our facilities. And again, with the passage of Issue 8, issue eight we intend to continue to keep that promise as well. Our enrollment is growing, and like I said earlier, and it's something that we need to keep a handle on and, and make sure that uh, we make sure that uh, we do have enough room for all of our students. Uh, we know there is an interest out there um, uh, in some areas of our community with some of our parents about looking at all day kindergarten as an option. Um, right now, space is an issue with us to double our kindergarten classrooms. Uh, we just don't have those extra classrooms right now. So uh, we are going to continue to look at that and work on that. Safety and security upgrades will always be something that we'll continue to do. And like I explained earlier, we're excited to get this report back from Homeland Security uh, to see what else they're recommending that we should do. I would also tell you that we're in conversations right now with Washington Township. Um, the township schools, uh, we do have a school resource officer that's employed by the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, one deputy that does that, and we're looking at increasing another deputy as an SRO for our township schools for next school year, so we'll add another school resource officer for next year. I mentioned educational technology, and, and Shannon and his staff have already done a great jump on that as well. Uh, we believe it's important that we continue to make sure that our high school students are leaving high school, college, and career ready. So we're going to continue to look at ways that we can expand career and workforce pathways. I uh, mentioned in the area of HR, the uh, goal of recruiting and retaining highly qualified teachers, and also um, combining that with adding diversity uh, to our staffing as well. And the last thing I always say is that um, I believe that we're very, very, very fortunate to live in the community that we live in. And so I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the city of Centerville, Washington Township, the park district, and the library system that we have in our community. Um, I've had the opportunity, my parents moved here when I was in middle school, had the opportunity to attend Tower Heights Middle School as a student a while ago, 10 years ago. Um, but uh, I've lived in this community over 40 years, and our boys, our two sons, and, and, and my wife and I feel very fortunate to be here. And uh, we feel it's a great place to raise a family. Uh, we feel it's an excellent school system. And our promise, again, to our community and to our parents is that we're going to continue to work hard to produce that excellent, excellent product that we believe our community and our parents expect and demand. And so we're going to work hard and we have great community partnerships with the other entity groups in this community. And like I said, uh, they're all part of the team. And so we're going to you know, work hard to continue to grow, continue to do well. And um, we're going to go far working together. And um, that's kind of where, where our goals lie. So at this point, Dan to my right, to your left, and John uh, going to have mics. And if you raise your hand, they'll, like I said, they're fast. They'll, they'll run up there and get the mic to you, and then we'll uh, answer any questions that you may have. So you brought up that you realize we have um, enrollment increasing. And I know some of our schools um, are packed and other schools are not. I realize that we can't build a building overnight. So what is the district looking at doing for next year that maybe could help reduce some of those large class sizes in some of our buildings, especially in smaller elementary buildings? Right, and that's a great question. We do have um, some areas that are not quite equal as far as the enrollment in the building, so you're exactly right about that. So. Uh, one of the things, we, we do have a process or a board policy that does provide uh, parents to request an interdistrict district uh, enrollment um, uh, 
change and so even though maybe they're in the attendance area of one building, they'd like to go to another building and that may be for a variety of different reasons. So one of the things we do look at is, is holding a line on some of those things because some of those buildings uh, have gained students because we've allowed those things to happen. Uh, we are continuing to study um, that and uh, down the road um, we are going to be looking at possibly doing some redistricting and reallocating where those attendance areas are. Uh, we're not quite ready to do that just yet. Um, we need to gather just a little bit more data, but that's something that we definitely are going to be looking at. Um, you're right, we can't build a building um, overnight. Um, you know, we, do, we, did, we were purposeful and deliberate in some of the renovations that we did in our buildings, um, PVN, PVS. Um, uh, Tower Heights actually was built uh, to provide an opportunity to actually increase another teaching team. Uh, there's some space there. Um, Magic is, is pretty full and uh, we're holding the line there on interdistrict transfers um, and, and Watts right now I think is, is doing okay, although they, they are our largest middle school right now. So it is something we're continuing to watch and we, we think we've got a handle on it right now, but it, you're right, it's something that we're going to have to deal with soon. Hi, so I have two boys in Centerville schools, and so I have two questions, one for each of them. So, um, you may remember last year I brought up the um, issue of a lack of persons of color who are teaching and in staff positions. So, I'm grateful that you are addressing that and that you, we are making some progress in that. Um, because I think we know from tons and tons of research that our black boys specifically benefit from having black teachers. So he will be very excited as he goes on, because he's a very energetic first grader right now, um, you know, to you know, see that benefit. Um, so I am grateful for that. I do have a question, though, with your relationship with UD. Are you sharing with all of your current teachers all of the information that's coming out of the Learn to Earn program? as far as academic achievements of our students and specifically, again, our black boys, how their academic achievements tend not to stay in line with their peer groups as they go through school. We actually had Dr. Tom Leslie come out and address like the high school staff and, and he did talk about some of those um, statistics and, and that. Um, we haven't trickled that all down to some of the lower levels just yet, but um, it, I, I'm in a meeting with Dr. Lasley every month, and so, you know, we are a big um, proponent of Learn to Earn, and uh, we are, you know, part of all that. So, um, you know, I am aware of all those statistics, and, and but we, we have focused at the, at the high school right now, some of those yeah. things. But you are going to trickle that down to mm -hmm. first grade, kindergarten, because those, pro those problems yeah. kind of start then. And, and just yesterday, or excuse me, Tuesday of this week, I was at a meeting downtown, and the other thing that we have to work on, too, is, is our, our higher ed institutions, too, because uh, the statistic actually from Dr. Lasley, uh, who used to be the dean at the University of Dayton in the School of Education, was that there's about 35% of, of, of students of color that go to the u universities, and out of that 35%, there's only about 10% that are going into education. So, um, you know, there are not a lot of, of diverse candidates out there in the School of Education right now. So that also is an area of focus as well that with the universities that you're trying to uh, get good candidates into that School of Education as well. And then I have a son who is thankfully a senior. Oh, I did not think he was going to make it, but he, he is. So one of the things that has benefited my, my son, who's a senior, are having essentials classes at the high school. And I heard a rumor, not from him, um, but uh, I've been told that you're considering eliminating the essentials classes in the high school. And I'd like to know if that's being considered. That, that is true. That is something that we're looking at. Um, you know, um, most of our essentials classes have uh, become uh, classes that, that mostly our, our special needs children have been taking. Not all of them, but, but a lot of them have been. And so John Carroll and his administrative team have been working with the high school staff for a year now, having those conversations about moving just to, you know, the, 
so that standards level class will be the classes and working with staff about differentiating, uh, taking students where they are and helping them grow where they are. So it will be a little bit of a change, but John has been working hard to make sure that uh, staff is ready and um, uh, that we're able to take that challenge on. Thank you. I want to uh, piggyback a little bit on your commentary. My name is Faraha Henry Jones. I have a daughter in middle school here, and she's come up through most of her years in Centerville City Schools. I'm representing one family of about 16 that have been meeting periodically since November to talk about um, the challenges of raising black and multiracial youth in a predominantly white school district. They've been fruitful and productive conversations. Um, I'm really appreciative to the district for its diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. I was pleased in November to see an article that you put in the Dayton Daily News, which made a public statement about that. I think that is incredibly necessary. I'm really here to um, invite any parents of black and multiracial students to join us in these conversations. Uh, the next one will be February 10th at Magazine Middle School at 7 p.m. And if you'd like more information. Um, I did have a question about the diversity, equity, inclusion committee that you have. Um, has there been any talk of holding particular conversations or focus groups with a variety of different uh, communities to kind of gather information about what parents are seeing, feeling, hearing um, in terms of the success of their students? I, I, can, I, I don't know exactly the answer if they've considered that or not, but they have been meeting regularly and they're actually working on putting together a plan of action, a, a variety of different things that they want to, to do. So. Um, it's, it's definitely something that I can get back with you regarding that specific answer, but they have been working very, very hard um, and um, they have a lot of things planned. Uh, I don't know if that's exactly one of them, but I can, I can follow up with you and let you know. But uh, they're committed and they're really, really working hard to do a variety of different things. And uh, the other thing that's really been nice is they've been leading uh, a, a lot of our staff down that path as well and they've been working hard with them. So we have a lot of good momentum right now uh, moving forward and, and uh, I think that's a credit to them and to their efforts and um, they're still working through a lot of different initiatives. Um, you know, they have our support, my support, obviously they're working kind of in the, underneath uh, uh, Bob, our assistant superintendent in, in the curriculum department and um, like I said, they they're working really hard on a number of different initiatives, but I could follow up with you and answer that question after I get with that. They're still planning a lot of those things right now. Thank you very much. Ms. Razzi. Um, we're new to the district, been here about almost two years now. We're a military family. Um, so we've been to 10 different school districts through having all of our kids. And I just want to let you know, Centerville is the best that we have found. So I want to start off with that. But I have a two-part question. Um, our middle schooler is struggling a little bit because of the way that you guys have it set up where they have the same teachers all three years. And um, we have not had anybody give us a reason why that system is that way, so if you could give me a little bit about why that's chosen. Um, he's finding, and I'm sure other students have this problem where it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad teacher, but personalities sometimes conflict, sometimes the teaching style doesn't work, and now this child is with this teacher for three years, and now I also have a younger child in elementary in a couple years. He'll be at the middle school, and I know he's gonna struggle because he's highly functioning, but on the spectrum. So if you could let me know why we do that and then the plans of possibly looking at changing that, how far down the road are we at at that point? 
Sure. Um, so um, for a long time, for many, many, many years, the middle school program has bought into the middle school philosophy, which is about helping that middle school child make that transition from elementary to high school. And part of that has to do with um, um, aligning that student with a lot of supports. And we know that that middle childhood age group of students can be very challenging for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, and so the concept that we've used in this district is that we believe and have believed over the years that having that, that looping in effect, if you want to call it that, or that same teacher provides an opportunity for hopefully um, a good relationship, hopefully a good opportunity where communication occurs between the teacher and the student, but also with parents um, as part of that as well. The advisory program is an example that's huge in the middle school as it is at our high school as well, but it's huge at the middle school of facilitating good conversation. And the middle schools have um, family groups, they call them, uh, 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 lots they call them pods, but it's the same principle. And the idea again was uh, this teachers really, really get to know the students well. Um, they get to know them as sixth graders. Um, they come in as seventh graders. They can kind of hit the ground running because they know them, they know how they're doing, they know how they are as a student. The same thing from the student perspective, they, they know how the teacher is, what they expect, those kinds of things. Um, generally, it's worked very, very, very well um, for us over the years. You know, I would say that there are some things that we can do, and, and obviously through communication and conversations about you know, trying to meet the needs of, of your son to make sure that things are better for him at, at wherever he is. And, uh, and it'd be something that I would encourage you to reach out to the principal and, and, and the counselor. And there's some things that they can do through conversations to make that situation better. As far as where we are right now, it's something that, that we're looking at right now. and we're, we're not too far down the pike. Um, the, the, the program that we have right now has been pretty ingrained in something that we've bought into and have believed in for you know, probably 40, 50 years. Um, so, um, but I understand what you're saying. I, I was a, a, a middle school principal for 12 years, so I know the program really well. Bob was a principal also at a middle school, and so um, it's something that we see a lot of good things about, but, but there are some, like anything, but there are ways that we can change and fix those things for the better. So I'd encourage you to reach out to the building principal and counselor and have that conversation so that they can work together on those things. Um, and, and come back around. So, but I appreciate your comments about the district uh, as you started with that. So, any other questions? Okay, one, one more. Good evening. My name is Naima Quarles Burnley sometimes known as Ms. Q. I'm a substitute in the district and I also have a son who's a senior here at the high school. Um, my question relates to how we're dealing with students that might be considered part of the achievement gap. Um, I was glad to see that the district was noted for pulling up students who are struggling but is there a comprehensive plan to close the achievement gap? And has there been any um, information disaggregated to identify whether or not some of those students are um, students of color? Yes, and, and we know that some of our subgroups, that the state identifies subgroups which include um, low socioeconomic um, groups, um, students of color, and other subgroups that, that they're not performing to the level that, that we want them to do that. And so all of our principals are involved in data conversations. Um, they have a lot of data now that they can look at. They're working with their staffs to address that. Uh, it's something that we can dive very deeply into now, um, more so than ever before. Um, the principals know who the students are, they've identified them, and like you said, they've, there is comprehensive um, conversations and programming in place to support those students. So uh, we know who those students are. We know that we have to do better, and we're working hard to do that. Um, and uh, we're not
not just resting. And, and um, you know, uh, thank you for acknowledging the award, but it, but we have to do better with some of our subgroups of students, and we're working hard to do that. So looking into the data, having those conversations with our teachers, and and talking about uh, intervention and remediation, and, and bringing those students, uh, meeting those students where they are, and helping them to grow is is all about the conversations that we're having. I just think it's important that we put the supports around the students and the teachers and to eliminate essentials classes is that's like one of the areas where you already have programmatically identified um, key aspects of the curriculum that you want to teach but you know that you can do it in a way that meets students who may be at lower levels. And so to hear that that may be eliminated is of concern. I know that my son has benefited from it, and I'm sure that there are many others. We don't want to put the burden on each teacher to have to modify their curriculum for individual students. Right, and so we, we do talk about differentiation and making sure that we are meeting those students' needs. And, and again, John's been working with his staff at the high school. We believe, I, I understand what you're saying, but you know, we believe that we can still do that, but, but not in those low-level classes, that, um, but in our standard classes. And we're hoping we'll continue to do even better uh, by doing this, but I, I hear what you're saying. But. So are you anticipating that you would have professional support or intervention specialist that would be a part of those larger classes yes, to yeah. support the students? Yeah, we'll have co-teaching models and yeah. inclusion and everything like that. That's correct. I think that'll be essential. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, I, I appreciate you being here tonight, and uh, I'll be here, I'll stick around after, and uh, I know my, uh, my central office team will probably stick around as well, so if you have any questions, uh, we'll be happy to answer those individually if you like. Thank you again for coming.